All right, so welcome back, everybody. My name's Andrew. And I'm Tiffany. And we're the Kellys. So I have been promising a series of videos that's going to eventually lead up to us finishing our home. And one popular question that I see on a lot of the forums all the time for people that are building houses is, hey, <laughs> we're going to look at living in a camper full time any tips, tricks, or thoughts. So that's what this video is gonna be about. We just got done living in this particular camper along with another one. There's a story there for almost three years. We've been full-time living in it while we develop our property here and build our house. So we've just got the CO and okay to move in that house. We've been unpacking this thing and moving out and we've experienced a a lot along the way. Some mm -hmm. good things, some bad things, and some good information to share. So if you're interested in living in a camper full time, you may want to watch this video. You may want to grab a pen and paper. I'm going to let you know some of the legalities of it, some things that I've learned there. Again, tips, tricks, things that we liked, things that we didn't like, and things that really kept us from, well, getting a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> Living in a camper full time can be quite challenging and there's some things that we did here that I think really helped us out. So we're going to share what that was. All right, so for starters, this is a 32 foot camper, pull behind camper here. We bought it simply because it was big, it had room, and the price was very affordable. We used to have another one that was almost identical to this, but mother nature and a tornado decided, well, we should no longer own that camper and it was totaled. So we turned right around and bought this one with a very similar layout. So a lot of our viewers have never seen inside. Now that it's not junked up and it's unpacked, we will uh, show this off here real quick. Nothing fancy at all about this camper again, mainly the price was awesome. So for starters, coming up into this camper, it has a queen size bedroom and sleeper right here with a little wardrobe area. We actually took this mattress out, put down some plywood, and we had a king size mattress in here. That was important and one thing that really helped us out, we really, do like a large bed that made this a lot more tolerable. We also took that window out and put a window unit in there so we could sleep with the bedroom really cold. Those are things you may not need, but it really helped us out. So coming in here, it's just your standard camper layout. Nothing fancy, a little kitchenette, a deep slide here that did give us some seating room. We kind of use this as an office. I did some editing in here for our YouTube channel. And we had a little fold down bed. Um, you know, nothing, nothing fancy at all. Now coming into the world's smallest bathroom, <laughs> this is one thing that was so tiny and that we will never miss and something that we recommend y'all try to get larger in your camper. This is the style with the quad bunks in the back. Believe it or not, this was key for us and something we really enjoyed. We used this room as a walk-in closet. We did plastic bins everywhere, pull-up bins with socks and underwear and clothes. We also hung some clothes up. Uh, so we used this whole entire space as a closet and storage that really, really did help us out. So feel free to speak up with anything you did or did not like, but one thing I can recommend just from personal experience to me personally, the bathroom was the biggest constraint throughout this entire living process. Yeah, at least here I can hand you some toilet paper. If you, <laughs> you better, if you're gonna live full time in a camper, you better be prepared to be very close to your partner. As in, she's not kidding. You may be in here eating, watching TV, and literally a couple of feet away is someone in a bathroom. Are you prepared for that? That well, actually, our other camper, it was reversed. The couch was over there. The table was over here. So you'd actually be eating that did, while the person is in the bathroom. <laughs> that did help a little. So I guess the first tip that we could give you all is get as large of a camper as you can afford. Now, I will say, me personally, I don't believe in going out and buying the latest and greatest in this big, gigantic 60 or $70,000 fifth wheel. If you're planning on selling that down the road to build a house, you're throwing your money away. There's plenty of good used campers on the market. But if I had this all to do all over again, I would get something with a larger bathroom. That was just my biggest hold up to this camper. Mm -hmm. Now we made it, we appreciate the camper. It uh, more than paid for itself to provide us room and board and a roof over our head for the last several years but get as big of a camper as you can because chances are you're gonna be moving a lot of stuff in there. You may have children, pets, dogs. By the way, we had one dog live with us in this camper as well. So a big bathroom, plenty of storage. We really did like the bunk area for being <clears throat> yeah, our closet. Yeah, that was a lifesaver having all that back there for sure yeah. to store all your stuff. So probably the next tip that I can give y'all is 
it's just going to be different for everybody. But I don't think we could have lived in this camper without us having an outbuilding, which I'm going to go show you that. We didn't actually use this camper for cooking and eating, although we did cook in here some. But the biggest thing for us, and I think what made this tolerable for so many years and for so long, was being able to escape this space. While we're not claustrophobic at all, staying cooped up in a camper day after day, week after week, month after month, that can get really old. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend if you're gonna to go to a piece of property and you're already planning on building an outbuilding, say like a pole barn like we have, or a shop, do that first, then be set up and ready for your camper. An outdoor living space, whether it's a seating area or an outside shop where you can go do some outside cooking, put a washer and dryer like we did, oh, yeah. and actually have real appliances, that's what made this truly doable i think for us so we kind of use this as a place to come in and shower just settle down for the night maybe flip the tv on and sleep that was about it other otherwise we were outside of this camper the entire time just so we weren't feeling claustrophobic so let's go ahead and go over some of the legalities real quick then we'll take a walk outside and i'll show you some things that we've done that i highly recommend doing for the living and for setting our land up for this so for starters, this is going to vary wildly depending on where you live. So you need to go to your local courthouse or annex and check all this information out. But if you want to live in a camper full time, there's some things that you really need to know. First of all, not every area is going to allow you to live in a camper full time. You're going to have to tread lightly on that subject. So if you want to move to a piece of property and you want this to be your permanent address, things are very complicated now ever since 9-11 due to national security reasons. I found all this out whenever we sold our home, went to move over here and transfer our address. Yeah, I had to jump through some hoops, so to speak. So if you go to your local courthouse, there is an office called a GIS office. They're the ones that do your addressing, record search, um, all kinds of different things right there. So if you go talk to them and tell them that you want to put an address on this property and you don't have house plans or a home, they don't want to give you an address. Then you're kind of left in limbo. We didn't know how to transfer mail packages or nothing. So I found a way around that. If you'll go down to your t local tax collector's office, talk to them, explain to them what's going on. Hey, we don't have a home. We're going to live full time in a camper on our property. Here's what they can do. They can actually send an appraiser out here who will look at this, treat this just like it's a mobile home, appraise the value of it. And if approved, they will give you what's called a real property permit or sticker that you stick on the outside. That's the same thing that you do on a trailer or a mobile home. So after you get that sticker, now you can go back to that GIS or addressing department and you can legally get an address here because, well, as far as they're concerned, this is now your permanent address. You have a permanent piece of property. You're paying your taxes on it. This camper just became real property. But what that also means is your camper is no longer roadworthy because now it's considered a permanent valued piece or a home piece of this property. So keep that in mind. If you want to live in this full time, but want to constantly hit the road, you can't seem to have one or the other. There could be a loophole in the way around this. I'm not really sure, but this, I'm talking to people that want to full time live like we did, develop property and actually build their home. And I'm finding out now that we're getting ready to sell our camper. I went and talked with the tax collector's office again. I do nothing. What you do then, whenever you get your home, you actually transfer your homestead or your homestead exemption, which is now on this area and this mobile home right here. You transfer that to your new home. Once you sell your camper to someone else and they go to the tax collector's office, they can put it back roadworthy. All they're doing is pulling a tag and registration, just like you normally would whenever you buy something that's mobile. And apparently all that happens automatically from what I'm being told. So some tips for the camper. I strongly recommend you block and chalk this camper everywhere that you can. I've already started taking some stuff out because we're getting it ready to sell. Put wheel chocks in, put extra blocking back here. You can use extra jacks to go up to the frame here. Also something I recommend is to put earth augers, what they call like a mobile home anchor down into the ground. And I just took it off today, but I had thick cable wrapped around frames and bumpers of this. And I had this anchor down everywhere. Now that is if you're in a state where maybe you're expecting high winds, tornado damage, or hurricanes. 
So that story I was telling you about, we actually took a direct hit from an EF1 tornado two years ago in a camper almost identical to this. And luckily I had it anchored to the ground. It tried to flip that camper and tore down the entire pole barn around it and actually totaled the camper while me and our little dog was in it. We walked away without a scratch. We're very thankful, but I highly recommend anchoring down if you're gonna be permanent. Now there is a problem with anchoring down. So say if you wanna set your new mobile home up, you got your real property sticker and you wanna either remove the wheels off or you wanna anchor it and tie this down. Now we get into a little bit of an issue with insurance. The insurance companies are not the world's biggest fans of people living full time in an RV or a camper. So if you call and get your standard rate, it's probably gonna be about a third to a fourth of what it would be if you're living in it full time. You need to be honest with them about that because should you have a major claim and they come out and see either wheels off of a camper means, hey, it's permanent now, or they see it anchored to the ground to where it's no longer mobile. Well, guess what? You need to report that, let them know you're living in it full time. And I hate to tell you, your rates are gonna go up dramatically. We used to pay about 300 something dollars a year for this camper when it was roadworthy. Once it became permanent, call and get that quote, well, it was a little over $1,000 a year. It's crazy how that changes, but be aware of that. I highly recommend anchoring your campers down. It literally may have saved my life, but that does change things with insurance. So these are some stabilizers that I got off of Amazon. They have a ratchet strap that pulls them together and really helps stabilize the camper. That makes all the difference in the world in a shaky camper when you're living with somebody else and you're trying to sleep on the other end and they're walking back and forth trying to get ready. I also had stabilizers underneath the slide out. So my tip is stabilize absolutely everything that you can. It really makes for more enjoyable experience on the inside. Something else that I recommend, especially if you're gonna leave an animal inside, if you're in a lightning state or have power outages, I purchased this automatic surge protector right here. So this is called the Power Defender and it's by Camco. And we've had this work several times. So say the AC is running like it is right now and it's a hot summer day, you had to go to work and you've got a little dog inside. Well, if you were to have a power outage or lightning storm come through, um, this not only will surge protect, and if it trips off, it automatically powers itself back up. So now you get air conditioning and stuff going back for your animals in there. By the way, this is that permanent sticker that I was just telling you about that you can get for mobile homes or this if you do make it permanent. So one other thing I recommend, if you know you're moving to a property full time and you're already planning on putting up a barn, do that ahead of time. Because if there's one thing I know about a camper, whether you buy one brand new, used, whatever it is, it's not if they will leak, but when they'll leak. Campers need lots of time and attention. They need to be sealed constantly. The roof needs to be sealed every few years. Go ahead and do yourself a favor and put it underneath a roof or structure if you can afford to do so. Go ahead and set yourself up financially, do that ahead of time. Not only does it keep the camper out of the sun, which is extremely destructive to all that lap joint compound and roofing, but campers are not insulated well. Keeping a roof overhead will keep that AC from running a lot. And this camper right here, that AC runs all the time. Actually, we have a relatively large electric bill. That camper, believe it or not, causes more of an electric bill than our new home does because it's just not very well insulated. So put a roof up, that is absolute key if you can do that. Leaving them outside, you're just asking for trouble. So septic, that is one large thing that a lot of people have a hard time figuring out whenever, well, they go to live full time on a piece of property. So there's two options that I can think of for you and depending on where you are, neither of them may be allowed or may work. So first and foremost is you can go ahead and put your full septic system in. If you know the size of the home that you're gonna build and you've got it sized correctly and your camper is gonna be somewhere near it, you can go ahead and put an actual septic system in and run your camper to it. That's not a problem. So whenever you first get a piece of property, you need to go have a sole and what's called a percolation test done. All that's done through the health department and someone that'll actually come out and take soil test samples, and then you can determine what size you're gonna put in. But they really need to go ahead and know the size of your home. My health department did not require house plans, but they needed me to go ahead and let them know the square footage of the home that we were gonna build that determines your drain field size. That's a very expensive option, but if you're already building, you're gonna need a septic system anyways. But it may or may not work out depending on the location of your camper. So another option, this may not be allowed everywhere, but an option that I had here that worked out 
beautiful for us is what's called an above ground holding tank. So our local sanitation companies that do porta potties and tank pump outs, things like that, they actually sell these above ground holding tanks for RVs. We live near the coastline and it's not uncommon for a lot of RVs to be set out and need somewhere to dump. So what we do here and what I highly recommend Get a several hundred gallon above ground holding tank. Now you can dump your wastewater into this. Keep in mind, it's gonna fill up relatively quickly. So this can be a costly option too, but doesn't cost anywhere near what an actual septic system does. For example, this 300 gallon tank, depending on if you're doing black water, gray water, or both, um, say black water, for example, about every six weeks, I need to have this tank pump. It costs me $55. I'll get on a route where there's a tanker truck that comes around pumping out porta potties, event potties, things like that, and they will also come by and pump this out. You leave them a check, it's pumped, it's ready to go. You've just got to be prepared to plan about a week ahead of time to make sure that you don't fill this up and get caught in a situation to where the tank's full on the inside and on the outside. By the way, when I bought this tank a few years ago, brand new, they were running about $600. And if you go to a lot of these porta potty companies, they have these tanks used for a few hundred dollars less. I really don't know what things are running nowadays with all the COVID excuses. So the first building that we built on the property is my metal shop. I already knew I wanted one. This is what I would say saved us more than just about anything. This was our outside space to escape to. So this is a room I built on the inside. Excuse the mess, but we're still packing up and moving. Over here, we had a dryer. On the other side of this sink, we had a washer. And what I'm basically doing here is this is my outdoor processing area. We knew that we were gonna need this room in the future for garden vegetables, processing meat, animals, things like that. So we turned it into a multi-purpose room. We also put a microwave out here, a toaster, convection toaster oven. That saved us, gave us something that we could really use as an oven. Full-size refrigerator and full-size freezer. Without a doubt, having that room in this building, I think is the main reason that Tiffany and I both can agree that we were able to live in that camper for so long. We didn't stay inside, we didn't get claustrophobic. We had a real space to come out here with real appliances. Ladies, I know, being able to have a real washer and dryer makes all the difference in the world. Running back and forth to town or using a small camper all-in-one washer and dryer, that's probably gonna get old after a while. Now your results and situation may vary. We lived out here for a few years. If you're doing just a few months while a house is being built, that changes things dramatically. Plus everybody's tolerance is different. The other thing that really helped us, we had a black stone out here, a gas grill, charcoal grill. So this was our entertaining space. We cooked outside, we enjoyed it, and we really learned how to use a lot of these appliances uh, in lieu of a inside oven, which we no longer had. And again, that room, this space was key. So thanks to that camper right there, we were able to build this house. And as you can see, it's still a work in progress, but we have our CO, we passed all safety and sanitation inspections, and we're currently living in the home. And if you're curious about, well, living in a camper and building your own home, I have almost 200 videos on the channel of me building this house from scratch. And like I said, it's still a heck of a work in progress. We have a lot going on there. So feel free to check all the videos out on the channel. One other thing worth mentioning, that a camper really helps you out with, you need some sort of an excuse on a new piece of property in order to put power in, what you call temporary power. Typically, you can only run a 100 amp service, which is more than enough for a camper, but if you already know you're gonna build a house, you need a temporary power pole anyways. So you can use that camper as an excuse or a pump and well, things like that, to go up there and pull your temporary power permit. Mine was registered as an RV site or a campsite, and that made the power process nice and simple. I'm sure there's still many more questions that y'all may have out there, but I wanted to hit on some of the, especially the legalities of it and how to go process things at the courthouse, because I just don't see a whole lot of people talking about that on living in camper full-time types of videos. If you have any other questions, that's what the comment section's for. Drop a comment. I'll do the best that I can to answer that for you. And please keep in mind, local jurisdictions change constantly. State rules change. Some of the things I mentioned today may not be allowed in your area. That's why you need to go to your local offices and ask that. Catch you on the next video.